Welcome everyone, my name is Chris and you are back for another episode of Nikon TV. Now obviously we are back in my kitchen, uh, Nikon is still self-isolating, we're still being safe, so we are going to have another episode from my kitchen instead of the usual setting at Nikon head office. Now what are we going to talk about in today's episode? Well we are going to talk about a very special new lens that we have. Uh, we're also going to have uh, another uh, getting to know your camera segment. In that segment, we're going to be talking about focus, shift, shooting. We're also going to have a bonus guest come in. Now, what I want you guys to do is, is there a function in your camera? Is there a feature? Is there something that you want a little bit more information on? Well, go and put it in the comments below and let me know what it is you want to learn about. So. You go throw those in the comments and I'll get back to it uh, in another future episode, whether it's autofocus, picture controls, you name it. I want to hear what you guys want to learn about. Uh, and lastly, after we get through the uh, guest section of getting to know your camera with Jay, uh, we will be doing another quick little interesting read section to give you guys a little bit more information to, to read about. Um, another one of my favorite photographers, but we'll get to that later. To start with, we are going to start with a very special lens. This is the 120 to 300 f 2.8 E F L E D S R V R lens. Quite a quite a mouthful. Uh, getting all that out. Um, and something I'll point out is that uh, I'm a little disappointed with some of our viewers. I, I got to say, I thought that we had some eagle-eyed viewers um, watching these episodes. And what you guys might have noticed last episode was these two lenses sitting here um, nicely out of focus. Well, yeah, they're out of focus, but I thought somebody might look at them and say, hey, I wonder what that is, that, that really prominent gold line along this lens. Well, I was actually teasing this episode because this is the 120 to 300. So I'll pop the hood off here. Now, Talking about this lens, uh, there are a few things that I want to talk about in terms of the lens layout. So when you go and look at the layout here, you'll see that there's actually two fluorite lens elements in it. This is really going to try and keep the weight down because this is a very, very high quality optical glass in this lens. So any amount of weight that we save is good. So there's two fluorite lens elements. Um, there's one... Um, nano crystal coating on here. There's also, what else do we have? Oh, we have the new Arneo coating. So this is the first time that we've actually had it in an F mount glass. Uh, we have our Neo coating in the 24-70Z f2.8. We have it in the Noct, which I'm actually filming this episode on right now, uh, the 58 0.95 lens. We also have it in the new 70-200 uh, 2.8Z lens. So this our Neo coating works very similarly to nano crystal coat. So nano crystal coat we've had for years and it really helps getting rid of flaring and ghosting when a high point light source is around the edges of the frame. So when it's coming in at a higher angle, that's really where nano crystal coat comes in. Our neo coating works with nano crystal coat and it helps to get rid of light that's coming directly into the actual uh, frame itself. So if, instead of having it off to the edge, a high point light source such as the sun, um, uh, light, uh, flashlight along the corners, right smack dab in the middle is usually where a lot of lenses have a tough time with flare and ghosting. That's where our Neo comes in. And lastly, we do have one brand new lens element that is in the 120 to the 300, and it's the SR lens element. So that SR lens element stands for short wavelength refractive element. And essentially it helps get rid of chromatic aberration. Uh, specifically, it's getting rid of chromatic aberration in the um, uh, blue and lower uh, light spectrum. So it's doing a very specific job, but the good thing, the, the kind of different thing about this SR lens element is the fact that usually um, exotic or, or specialty lens elements need to be in a very particular place within the lens layout. So the optical engineers kind of have to figure out, okay, well, this lens element has to be here. Therefore, we have to kind of shift the other elements around to make it work within that layout. The nice thing about the SR lens element 
is there's none of those restrictions. It can essentially go anywhere within the formula, which means that you can have much more flexible arrangement of elements within the actual lens itself. So you can really kind of optimize whether it's the sharpness, the bokeh, and you don't have to worry about, oh, I need this lens element in here, but it has to be in place A. It can be anywhere that the uh, lens engineers actually want. So that's kind of the techie side of the lens itself. Now, for the 120 to 300, who is this lens geared for? Well, when you look at it on the face of it, it's pretty much sport photographers. That's, that's what uh, the, the main audience is expected to be. Um, this obviously is great for sports such as volleyball. Uh, we have a couple of examples here. So for volleyball shooting, you want a versatile lens, something that's gonna be able to zoom in, grab the guys as they're diving, as they're hitting, as they're blocking. And the nice thing about this is you're getting the versatility. And that's really the key to this lens, um, no matter who's using it, is it's the versatility. You're getting the quality of a prime, but you're really getting the versatility of that zoom. And with that f2.8 aperture, you're really kind of getting the best of, of both worlds. So for certain sports that don't need a four, five, 600 mil, uh, that's really what this is geared for. But also for those sports, let's say you have soccer, you might be on the sideline and have a five or 600 mil on, as your main lens on your body. And then a lot of guys will shoot with a 70 to 200, something a little bit, um, not quite as long for the, for the wider angle stuff. Well, this kind of fits perfectly within that sphere. So this may replace that 70 to 200 for a lot of photographers. So it's mainly geared for sports photography. Okay. But I have a feeling wildlife photographers are actually gonna jump onto this quite a bit more than we kind of expected. Um, one of the reasons is just the image quality. Uh, I'm absolutely blown away by the image quality of this lens. And when I'm talking image quality, let's kind of compare it to uh, apples to apples, even though it's not really apples to apples because one's a prime and one's a zoom. Most photographers, when they're talking about primes and they're talking about the non 400 500s really use the 300 f 2.8 quite a bit and i know a number of photographers who swear that their 300 even with teleconverters is sharper than some of their higher end primes they absolutely love the image quality of this lens so really when you're comparing the 120 to the 300, this is the one you have to put it up against in terms of the bokeh, in terms of the sharpness. And I can tell you right now in the testing that I've done uh, over the last couple of weeks with this lens, sharpness is as good, if not a little bit better than the 300. But to be totally honest, the more important function that this lens has to serve is how does the bokeh look? How does that background look in comparison to a prime? Because there's only a couple zooms that we have um, and I'll say, I'll, I'll say there's only a couple zooms that Nikon makes, and this kind of goes across the, the rest of the field as well. Most zooms have a look. They have a look that it isn't that completely buttery smooth um, prime bokeh that you, that you kind of know. You see a shot and you go, I think that was shot with a prime. Um, our 70 to 200 FL, the, the 2.8, the, the latest version for the F mount, and the 180 to 400. Those two zooms kind of break the mold because they really have a look that I wasn't used to with a zoom lens. They really had a prime look to them. And to be totally honest, I'm seeing that here in spades with the 120 to 300. The look is absolutely phenomenal. Now, how else are we gonna compare them? Well, let's do a Mark Cruz flex here for a second. Um, so we have these two lenses here. So we have the 120 to 300 and the 300 mil. So you can see that the 120 to 300 is a little bit larger, which you would expect with the versatility you get with a zoom, but it is a little bit heavier as well. So you're at about 2,900 grams for the 300 mil and you're about 350 grams more for this. Uh, you're at about um, 3,250, I believe, for the 120 to the 300. So for that added versatility, that extra little bit of weight, I'm okay with. It is still a big and heavier lens than some people are used to, um, but the quality you're getting out of it is spectacular. Now, if you were to kind of take the combination of how a lot of photographers actually shoot when they're in the field, they may not bring just a 300 mil with them because they want some versatility. So a lot of guys are gonna go and bring the 300 mil 
And then they're also gonna go and bring a 70 to 200 2.8. So when you take the whole system into consideration, this is actually much lighter because you're looking at about 3250 uh, grams for this. You're looking at over 4300 grams for the combination of a 300 mil and a 70 to 200. So when you look at it that way, uh, you are actually getting some weight savings with the 120 to 300. The 300 is absolutely spectacular still. Let's see if I can get that back in the right spot. Um, but this 120 to 300, I have just absolutely fallen in love with it. Um, image quality is spectacular. That bokeh, as I mentioned, that transition from your subject to the background, it really does look like a prime. And from what I've seen so far, uh, similar to the 180 to 400, there is literally no downside to shooting wide open. Um, a lot of the time with older um, lenses, we had to really stop down to get the, the best quality. Well, we're seeing that obviously with the Z lenses, but with our high end, telephotos, I'm really seeing that as well. So getting spectacular quality uh, from that 120 to 300, and that's really what makes it special for me, is it, it looks like a prime while giving you the versatility of a zoom. All right, so that was a quick little preview. Uh, I may come back, I'll tease this, I may come back in a couple weeks, the next episode, and have a little bit more information, uh, show some more examples, have a little bit more of a breakdown on that lens, and I may even have a special guest with me. Um, but I wanna talk now the getting to know your camera segment. So this week we're talking focus shift shooting. Now, first off, uh, this feature is found in five of our cameras currently. It's the D850. D780, D6, and then on the mirrorless side, we're talking uh, the Z6 and the Z7. So these five cameras have the focus shift shooting feature built into them. Now I will say um, a couple things. A, go and write your feature that you wanna learn about in the comments below, and I'll get to in future episodes. And lastly, um, when it comes to focus shift shooting, I'm gonna go through some, some quick features here, some quick things uh, to highlight and keep in your brain. But if you wanna go and learn more, uh, Nikon, you're obviously watching this streaming. Uh, we've been streaming a lot over the last uh, couple of weeks. Some of that information is, has been um, seminars that we've done previously. Uh, for anybody who's watching those, do not worry, we are not holding seminars now. Those have been previously recorded and we've resurrected them. One of them, we uh, streamed that about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, it was on macro. If you go back and watch that entire seminar, which I actually um, uh, did, if you go watch that episode, then you will go and see a whole section on focus shift shooting. So there's a lot of information there. And also just yesterday uh, on the 8th, uh, we went and streamed, I think it was four videos, one of them being macro. In that macro, it was a focus shift shooting section. There's a lot of pertinent information that's crammed into about a six, seven minute long video. So I'd really highly recommend if you are, are uh, liking the information I'm giving here and you wanna learn even more, you wanna get more into it, go check out definitely the macro smaller uh, five to eight minute video. And then if you really want a long um, uh, uncompressed version, go check out the seminar that we did. All of these are being done, streamed on our Facebook channel. Uh, you can go back and watch them at any time. We've also put schedules up. So there's a lot of information out there on this. I'm personally gonna be going through and hitting kind of my top features that I like with this, that I kind of wanna have in your head. Now, before I even get there, before I even talk about focus shift shooting, what is focus stacking? Because focus stacking really is what utilizes focus shift shooting. So focus stacking, usually you're shooting either macro work or landscape work where you want to get everything from closest to infinity perfectly in focus. Generally though, you're not going to be able to achieve that because either your depth of field just isn't wide enough or even if it is somewhat wide enough, you're not gonna be shooting at an optimum aperture to achieve the critical sharpness. So generally, uh, critical sharpness is achieved at f8, uh, f11, depending on your, your sensor. So let's say f8 is the optimum sharpness of most lenses out there before you hit diffraction. If you go and shoot at f22 to give yourself wider depth of field, your focus actually goes down a little bit. This is called diffraction. It happens with every lens, every body. Um, 
And it's something to keep aware of when you're shooting those landscapes. If you want critical focus and critical sharpness at f8, your depth of field generally isn't gonna be large enough. So focus stacking is when you shoot multiple images and you take those slices of in-focus shots, you use third-party software such as Photoshop or Heliacon, that's my personal favorite, and you'll then allow the software to stack the photos together to give you one image that's perfectly in focus. So that's focus stacking. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, how do you actually shift that focus? There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, generally, a lot of people, just because they don't wanna be carrying around extra gear, they're actually gonna manually do it. So they're gonna hope that they're able to do it again and again and again as they're um, going through their entire sequence. You can do it that way, but it's not very repeatable, at least not for me. I'm <laughs> not Superman. I, I, I can't go and do it every single time. So focus shift shooting is what automates the ability to get a focus stacked image. So we're now able to, and I'll show you here, if you go into the menu of focus shift shooting, you have all these different options. And all these different options allow you to completely automate the process. So right off the bat, we have the number of shots. Number of shots, this is kind of an easy one, uh, very self-explanatory. It's how many shots you're telling the camera to take for your entire sequence. Okay, well, it sounds easy, but there's a little bit more to it because it depends what you are shooting. Are you shooting landscape? If you are, generally, because your depth of field is gonna be rather wide anyways, you can get away with shooting very low amount of shots between, let's say, four and 15. Um, so that four and 15 shots is where what you would tell the camera to go and do. But if you're doing macro photography, you're gonna need a lot of shots, especially if you're really, really close to your subject. So that's why we have this number of shots feature. Um, you can go all the way from one, all the way up to 300. Obviously 300 is if you're doing uh, very, very, very small uh, macro work. The next option though, this is the key that I really want to spend a little bit more time on, and it's called focus step width. Focus step width, this you have the option of between narrow, one, and wide all the way to 10. Now, what this function is, is telling the camera how much of a change of focus, how much you shift that focus in between shots. If you're set to wide, 10, like we are now, then the camera's gonna be making very large jumps in between focus. So think of a landscape photo, where you aren't gonna be shifting on a, on a millimeter basis or even on a centimeter basis. You're gonna be focusing in meters. You can be maybe doing two meters in between each shot to make sure you have enough overlap. Well, you would be shifting on your focus step width um, anywhere between like, a, I'd say for five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, the higher end of that spectrum for landscapes. But for macro photography, you really wanna be staying closer to the narrow side. So staying closer to the narrow side means that you're gonna have more overlap, which means that the software afterwards is gonna have a much easier time of stitching your photo together, of layering all those different um, uh, focus uh, stacks together into one image. So I would recommend, now all of us you do have to play around with and kind of get to know your own settings, your own uh, kind of what you like, what works for you. But I would really say for most macro work, start at around three and most landscape work, start at about seven or eight. See how that works, play with it, see if, if you get good results, if you do, then everybody's happy. But if you do need to kind of play around with it a little bit more, the great thing about this whole feature is it's repeatable. And that's what makes it amazing is when you're all doing it yourself and you're manually focusing and hoping you're doing a good job, if you wanna go and do the same poll two, three, four times in a row, it's gonna be really difficult, especially if you're on a macro scale. But, well, sorry, macro photography scale. Um, but if you're doing landscapes, you can probably get close. Having focus shift shooting, have it be done again and again and again, very repeatable, makes it really, really easy. So focus step width is key. Uh, interval uh, until next shot, again, that's pretty explainable. Uh, that's how long the camera's gonna wait until it takes the next shot. I usually keep it on zero. 
uh, unless for whatever reason I'm using flash. If I'm using flash and I want to let the flashes recycle, I'm gonna go and give it maybe three, four, five seconds in between shots. Um, but generally, as you can see here, I'll keep it on zero. First frame exposure lock, I would keep that as on. Peaking stack image. So peaking stack image, what this does is it lets you very easily see after you've shot the sequence, um, how much of your subject was actually caught in focus. So it's a black and white image and it's going to, it's going to essentially create an in-camera focus stack that will give you an outline of your subject showing you how much is in focus. So it's a nice little neat aid to see how much was done right, right out of the camera. Um, now I will point out that for peaking stack image, this will only work when you're using Z lenses. So if you're using your 105 f2.8 macro lens, you will see that this is grayed out and that is why you can only access this when you are shooting with a Z lens. Uh, silent photography, uh, some people like to turn this on just because it's going to uh, decrease wear and tear of your, of your shutter. Um, it's also just not going to be as noisy when you're actually doing it, especially if you're doing uh, 100, 150 type shots for your macro shooting. Keep it on and it'll be uh, less disruptive to those around you. But this right here, hidden down in the bottom, which many people may not even come across, this for me is one of my favorite segments, uh, sections of this feature, specifically when it comes to workflow. So when you actually go in here, you can see that I have new folder selected and you can obviously reset the file numbering as well uh, when you're going through and shooting each new sequence. For me though, I don't care about the file numbering, but I want a new folder, which means every single time I do a new sequence of a, let's say 100 shots, those 100 shots are in a new folder. I do another sequence, 100 shots in another folder. Do a new sequence, 100 shots in another folder. Because you can imagine, if you do 10 sequences at 100 shots each, if you manually have to go through and figure out the, where one starts, oh, it, it, gets, it gets very confusing very quickly and it's a bit of a time suck. So to save yourself all that time, go and make sure you have starting storage folder as new folder selected. It will save you a ton of time. Now, once you're done all that, you go and hit start and it's going to start from where you initiated or told the camera to focus. So that means where do you wanna start your focus? You wanna start your focus at the closest thing that you want in focus. Makes sense, but as we actually uh, hear from Jay, I'm hoping that he's actually gonna talk about the fact that he likes to be a little bit more creative uh, with his projects and have a little bit out of focus in the foreground. And the way he does that is, well, one of the ways he can do that is he can actually start the focus where he wants it. And then when he hits starts, it's gonna go from there to infinity and then stop. If he had started all the way at the front, he might have another 10, 15, 20 shots that he's just gonna throw out anyways. So if he knows he doesn't want them, be creative, toss them out, and start where you want. All right, so that is focus shift shooting. We've gone through some of the menus. If you do want more, go and check out the Macro Learn and Explore video or the seminar that we streamed a couple weeks ago. Both of those uh, options have a lot of great uh, technical information that you can really sink your teeth into and learn a lot more about. But it's now time for our guest segment. This is the first time we've done, a, done an at-home guest segment. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to get ready here and I'm gonna go and give Jay a call. Now, Jay is uh, one of our sales reps out on the West Coast. He works for Nikon. He's a phenomenal photographer. He does a lot of uh, flash work, um, does a lot of uh, bird photography. He's a bit of a twitcher but he's really gotten into, really sunk his teeth into focus shift shooting over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I've been, while we're at home, I've been giving some of our reps uh, some challenges to do just to kind of keep their product knowledge up where it should be and to maybe teach them things that they may not normally have time to, to learn about. So I went and gave him this project and he has absolutely run with it. So that's why I'm here because there's the technical side of it, then there's also the creative side. So you're gonna see a lot of creativity from Jay with this project that he's taken on. All right, so let's get him up and going now. Alrighty, welcome Jay to Nikon TV. Uh, you are the first 
at home Nikon TV guest that we've had. And just so you know, um, we've actually, uh, uh, I say we, uh, the viewers and I, uh, have actually gone over already focus stacking. We've already gone over the focus shift shooting feature. We've gone through some of the major aspects of it. So the techie stuff, we've already kind of gone over a little bit. So you don't have to go through that too much. I really kind of wanted to bring you on here to talk about more the creative side, this whole project that I kind of gave you a couple of weeks ago and you've just absolutely run with. But to kind of start off with, there's also more of a, a mushy, heartwarming uh, feature to this as well, because it's not just about photography or Nikon. It also kind of helped involve your, your family. Uh, could you kind of talk about that aspect of the project before we get into the project itself? Oh, for sure. So um, I'm glad you asked that because... As you know, we've been getting these sort of getting to know your camera type things. And, and I got the focus shift one and I was racking my brain trying to figure out like, what am I going to do for a cool focus shift? And so my oldest son, he's about to turn seven, his name's Ethan. He said, well, daddy, what about Lego? And I was like, oh, what an amazing idea. So he and I sat down, we started brainstorming this, this sort of Lego idea. And so it basically became like, the evil Professor Snape chasing Harry and Hermione in our backyard. And so I was like, hey, this is amazing. So he's been helping me every step of the way. So all of the stories for each of the vignettes that we shot and the ones that we're going to hopefully be able to show today, these are all Ethan's stories. It's been my job to work with him to kind of bring that story to life using the assignment given by you of the focus shift shooting. Um, so it's, it's really been actually quite the adventure. We've done now 15 different images and every single storyline is Ethan generated. And what's kind of fun is because we're at home right now and I'm starting work really, really early, we're actually shooting him in the afternoon while my littlest has a nap. And then before Ethan goes to bed every night, now I'm actually showing him the end result photoshopped image and he wants a bunch of big prints for his wall. So this has turned into like a way bigger thing than the assignment that you gave us, but it's been so much fun. Oh, that's amazing. I, I absolutely love hearing that because it, it really kind of takes it not just from, yeah, 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 okay, it's this, it's this Nikon project that you've given me. It's not just the photography that you love. It's also turned it into to a family project that you're both kind of all getting something out of. And the thing that kind of grabbed me is when, when I was talking about the, the focus shift shooting and focus stacking, I kind of generalized and said, landscapes, or macro. Now you're not actually, you're, you're using kind of a middle of the road. You're kind of doing these little vignettes, these little dioramas, and you're not actually using macro lenses at all. So I'm actually gonna show the first image up here. So this was the very first image that you took in your backyard. Um, so I'm showing them first a couple slices, the one and then two. And now, right now, I'm going to go and show them the fully stacked image. So now they're seeing everything put together that you used um, uh, third-party software to, to use. Now, before I get into the Photoshopped version, which has uh, spells being cast, it has lanterns throwing off light. Before we even get into that, can we talk a little bit about uh, how you shot this? So let's talk, start off with what lens you used. And let's talk about your focus step width and maybe how many shots you took. Okay, so the thing with, with all of these that I was trying to do, and it was, it was a tough process to get into because what I was trying to do was actually like isolate the subjects. And in my backyard, I have a big, ugly chain link fence and a big, ugly picket fence against the back of the backyard. So what I quickly discovered is when I stacked the entire thing, well, it had the ugly chain link fence and the ugly picket fence in the background. So then I realized that I actually had to like shoot less to kind of keep that background effect or the bokeh of the back and the bokeh of the front in there. So almost using focus shift to be almost more of a tilt shift type thing. Um, it took a lot of experimentation. Like the first one that we shot Ethan saw some of the worst side of me because I was getting so frustrated. Like, I just couldn't figure out how to get it quite right. Like, I shot this one, and I stacked it together, and I shot the lens wide open. And with the backlighting, it created all kinds of ghosting issues. And 
So, I mean, the, the first one that you're seeing there is, has got to be the result of about 900 different images to arrive at that result and probably 14 or 15 different ways of stacking to arrive at that result. But wow. that result is where I wanted to get to. Now, now, what lens did you shoot that with? That was the, uh, that was the Nikkor Z. That was the 50 millimeter 1.8S. Okay, so, so this is a non-macro lens. This is just the regular 50 that you can purchase with the Z lenses right now. And what aperture were you, were you um, shooting with? And what did you find was kind of um, optimum? I finally arrived at f2.8 for this one. Uh, f4. And what I was finding was actually that f2.8 to f4 little jump actually even made a pretty big difference as to what my background would end up looking like. Um, because and that's I'll be key, because, because, yeah, because you'd mentioned that you wanted that background blown out. So you wanted to make sure that you had it wide open enough to be able to blur that background and the foreground to really kind of distract from what, what you didn't want in the photo. Correct. Correct. And uh, so uh, 900 images later, you know, the last stack of 50 images that I shot was at f2.8. And as soon as I kind of pressed playback on the camera and started looking at back at camera, I was like, okay, good to go. Now I got to take these files inside and, and stack them, um, which was a whole different wormhole before even the 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 third party software and Photoshop wormhole was focus stacking itself using software. Now, which software did you, did you kind of uh, narrow down at the end and use? Well, okay, I started with Photoshop. Um, I ended up using Helicon Focus, which I, I love. Thank you for that. I bought the full version after you let me, uh, you sent me the link for the trial. I'm like, I'm gonna be doing this a bunch. So I paid the money and I got the full version. But a, a couple of quick cautions um, just for people out there that might want to try this for the first time. First lesson I learned is do not open raw files as layers in Photoshop. Take them into Lightroom, make your JPEGs, then pull those JPEGs over because I don't care what kind of system you have at home. Photoshop does not like 50 raw files and especially not from a Z7. So I waited four hours for it to finally just crash and went, Hang on, did I just try to stack a bunch of raw files? Oh, man. So anyways, <laughs> lesson learned. First things first, do all your adjustments and make JPEGs. Then I, I like Helicon because the way I was able to achieve that sort of tilt shift look is in the preview along the right side. You can throw away images that you don't want in your final image, and it actually shows you a preview of what you're going to get. So that's how I arrived at that tilt shift look. It was almost a happy accident because I took out the last like 14 files and I didn't mean to, but then I saw the preview and went, oh, this is amazing. There goes the, the picket fence and the chain link fence that I was gonna have to do something to. Now they're just gone. So it, it like such an adventure, such an adventure, just getting to that point. So now that was just to actually stacking the images, which they're now seeing again uh, up on screen. Now from there, you then had to go and go an even further down another rabbit hole because you wanted to go and have it be interactive. You wanted it to look like it was Hermione and Snape and, and Harry in the actual uh, world. So there needed to be spells, there needed to be smoke. So talk very quickly, because I know you could basically teach a course now on it. Um, so talk a little bit of what, about what you wanted out of this and what you're happy with. Okay, so they're not seeing the final, final, but the final. Okay, yeah, so it, this was like such a deep, dark wormhole. Okay, so I stack it all together. I'm super proud of the image, and I take it, and I show it to Ethan. And he looks at me and goes, well, why would they be running? Like, Snape ends up being their friend. What are they running for? Like, what Snape does spells. Where is this spell? And I was like, oh, okay. So um, got on YouTube. And just started looking up like some Photoshop compositing courses. And we we have a subscription to LinkedIn Learning. So I even got into that and started doing these Photoshop compositing courses. And there's about 30 hours of content that I consumed to begin kind of falling down this wormhole. Like I I learned a lot of different things to actually 
be able to even execute to that level. Um, finding Photoshop brushes, installing Photoshop brushes, like just all these little things that you don't consider in the pursuit of happiness for your six-year-old um, that you just go ahead and do. So, I mean, a, a ton of Photoshop knowledge, but a lot of lighting knowledge that has to come along with that. Um, because I think if you're showing the, the image that I think that you're showing them, there's this big highlight on the back of Hermione's head. And of course I showed them the image and then I'm looking at it later on and I go, well, hang on. Like, you just shot a bright green spell. That highlight needs to be green and there would be more glow from that highlight and there'd be more glow from Filch's lantern and which direction would that light travel and how would it fall off? So all these things that I learned from this compositing course. And I, so, yes, a very, very long, deep, dark hole. And as the images got more complex, obviously, I had to learn a lot more. Okay, so, so let's actually go to another image then. Uh, so you, the, the, the backyard shot was kind of your, your first attempt. You, after all those hundreds of shots, you're finally happy with it. But let's go and bring up one. I think this was actually shot in your office now. Um, so they're showing, uh, I'm showing them um, the uh, initially stacked image. So all of the images that are put together. And now I've gone and put up the final, final Photoshopped image with some spells, with um, everything that you had kind of worked towards. Can you talk a little bit about what else you learned and what you put into this image? Okay, so first of all, it was the story was that Lord Voldemort had taken over my office. So the first thing I wanted to do was get some pictures of Lego Lord Voldemort on my on my main laptop screen and on my external, and then that little one on the phone. So none of that was photoshopped in; that was all in there. Um, I wanted the overall lighting scenario to be green because I wanted to try to capture as much in camera to save myself Photoshop later on. So I found my old Roscoe theatrical gel set and I actually gelled my desk lamp to give the overall feeling of the scene green. I, I used the 50 again at F2.8 because lessons learned, right? Um, put the, the Z mirrorless camera in there to give Voldemort something to stand on. Um, and so then there it was, the first thing I wanted to do was get all the light sources in there. So all the different spells from everybody. And then it's the interaction of those spells, which would be the next thing. But the deep dark wormhole was like, if you look on the left side of the image where Hermione is blocking the Death Eater spell, well, the Death Eater would have a red glow from his spell and Hermione would have a blue glow from her spell. But how does she cast shadows? And where would that glow from the red spell actually fall? And how do the two interact? Did they actually make purple or is it just a blend of blue and red? And so like all the masking and erasing and everything that had to get done. Then the, the shadow around Harry and Filch's lantern, because that would make a totally different way for shadows to fall. And the taillights on the back of the car, casting light across the keyboard of my laptop. How does that light interact? How does it fall off? Like the inverse square law. How do you do the inverse square law with the Photoshop brush? So, I mean, that was the one that probably out of all of them, except maybe the one I did uh, a couple of days ago, that was the one that, that really got the brain matter going um, more than anything else. And the interesting thing about this one is I shot 50 images, but only actually ended up having to use 14 of them. Well, that, that's one of the things I was going to ask. I was going to ask you how many shots on average were you using for these small little vignettes? For the most part, it would be 50 that I would shoot. And the actual use would depend on how front to back I wanted to go. 25 to 30. Because, of course, like in focus shift, it, it'll either go to infinity or your number of shots, whichever comes first. Um, and I often found myself not wanting that fully front to back background. I'm trying to stick to that sort of theme of it starts to fall off towards the back. And like in, you know, in the case of my office, well, I have my gear cabinet out behind my external screen. Well, I don't want the whole world to see the amount of gear in my gear cabinet. So I let that actually fall off into like, okay. And then I actually cropped the front of the frame. Um, and that was just a crop done by me at the end. But I mean, the whole thing about it is like, I, failed 600 times to have my first success and then 
the couple of hours I got to spend each time just kind of working the story and working the image with Ethan, just, you know, that's been super valuable. The Photoshop learning has been incredibly value valuable, but it's just, it's been a really good kind of, we're stuck here on lockdown. It's been a great lockdown project. Um, Ethan and I this morning sat down while I was having morning coffee. We cooked up four more stories um, that I am going to have a solid challenge to execute because as he's going through the process, he's making the stories more intricate. So I'm going to be taking the little Lego car and I'm going to have to be suspending that somehow in midair. And so that'll, I'm working my cloning skills evidently. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's been this ongoing project and I'm learning. Disease do focus shift and they do it really, really well. Um, I've learned with the 50 millimeter f1.8 around focus step four or five at about f2.8 seems to work really, really well for me. Um, the one I shot a couple days ago, I used the 35, but right up close at minimum focus distance. And I actually had to decrease the focus step width and shoot a whole bunch more files because every other way I tried it was just wasn't working the way I wanted it to. I'm starting to see now when I look at back at camera and just review the images, whether I got it or not. And so right away, I'm just like, I'm not importing a ton of files. It's format memory card start again. Um, but now Ethan's calling it out too. He's looking at the back of my camera going, oh, that's not going to work. Going, okay. Okay. <laughs> so. Well, so we only really had time to talk about two of your images. You did say that there's a huge amount of them that you've gone through and you have more planned. Uh, I'm actually throwing a couple up right now of my favorites. Uh, one of them was um, in the kitchen and one of them was in the jungle. Now the kitchen one, I absolutely love because of the reflections and the jungle one, I, to be honest, I just love the fire. I love the overall aesthetics of it all. For me, those two really stand out and I love them. Um, so I want to say, Jay, thank you very, very much for coming. Uh, so I think the couple quick takeaways I think you've, you've given people is you really have to get to learn the process because you are going to fail. But you know what? It's a fun thing to do, especially when we're stuck at home. So take the time, learn a little bit, and the end result is definitely worth it. And what a lot of people may not have realized is kind of what you hit on to without even thinking about it is you don't need a macro lens to go and shoot these. You can go and do it with a regular 35, a regular 50. You were using a 24 to 70 at some point, I know. So you don't have to have a dedicated macro lens to go and shoot these little dioramas, these little vignettes. So you can really kind of use it with the gear that you have at home. So with that, I will say, Jay, thank you very much for joining us. Um, later on, I, I might tease this, uh, I might have you back on to talk a little bit about autofocus or birding, because I did tell the, the viewers before that you're a bit of a tw uh, twitcher, a bit of a bird photographer. So I might have you on to talk about some bird photography uh, in a couple Absolutely. weeks. Time. Sounds good, man. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much, Jay. Take care out there, bud. All right, so that was a great little segment with Jay. Now we're gonna end off with our interesting reads segment. This interesting reads is just to kind of give you guys some supplemental information, nothing really to do with what we talked about today, just stuff that I find interesting. Uh, photographers or blogs that I've followed for years that I just kind of want to pass on to you guys and while you're at home or you have a little bit more time than usual, you can go through and kind of go down your own rabbit hole, whether it was with Joe McNally that I gave last uh, week or one of my other favorite photographers, Dave Black. Now the link we're going to be putting into the comments section, uh, that's going to be to his his blog. Uh, he calls it Workshop at the Ranch. Uh, he does have an entire website, but I'm going to really uh, talk about that. Now, with his <laughs> with, with his blog, I've been following this since probably about 2004, 2005. So a really, really long time. That's how long he's not only been shooting, he's been shooting way longer than that, um, but he's been teaching, teaching on the internet back then, shooting digital. Uh, so this first um, a clip that I'm going to be showing you, uh, well not clip, first uh, part of the website I'm going to be showing you. This blog was from 2003 and it was shot on a D100. Now uh, Dave's known for a lot of different things, um, amazing sports photography, but what I kind of started to, to learn from him at first was back then, for me it was an unknown um, technique, and it was light painting. 
Then he went on and, and turned light painting into sports photography and portraiture and he did all sorts of amazing things on it. And that's all on his blog. But I really kind of started off um, looking at some of his images, seeing the way the light fell with his light painting techniques. And I just, I was blown away. I'd never seen anything like it. So. I'm gonna give a, a couple links down there. One is gonna to be to one of the first light painting uh, images that really, to me, show off uh, what Dave Black, uh, his, his look, his style really truly is. And then uh, I'm gonna go and throw another one in there just that I love. I love the image, I love how it looks. And then I'll also throw in just his regular new um, workshop at the ranch images, kind of starting from the, from the very beginning, which is, basically now, because he updates it probably on a monthly basis, a little bit less. All right, so we've gone through this amazing new 120 to 300. We've had our amazing guest, uh, Jay, uh, talking about focus shift shooting. And I've also gonna give you some links for, uh, in, for the interesting read section on Dave Black. Uh, if you guys have any information you wanna learn about when it comes to getting to know your camera, make sure you throw it in the comments below and I will get to it in future episodes. Until then, thanks very much for joining me and tuning in. My name is Chris, and I will see you on the next Nikon TV episode.